Hello everyone, welcome to the second part of the introduction to the Warsaw Jewish Ghetto Tour. As previously mentioned in the first part, we have two more surfaces to describe, two more parts to explain. The first part will be related to the mm, Jews living in Europe and I would like to chronologically present what kind of experiences did the Jews face in here. And then the second section of this um, episode will explain the third part um, of the introduction. And this third part of the introduction is how was it happening that the Jews would pick Poland more often as a place to settle than other countries in Europe. I hope you're going to enjoy it and that you're going to learn something more from that very meeting. Jews were living across the whole European continent and once we are going to speak about the chronology of how it was going then the most convenient way will be to start with the western edge which is of course Spain um, I mean today Spain and Portugal the truth is that in this country um, because of the very very close neighborhood of the northern edge of Africa and as we know the northern edge of Africa was more related to the Muslim tradition then because of the rides that would take place at the Iberic Peninsula um, we are going to have a lot of influence coming from the Muslim culture and staying in the Iberic Peninsula for centuries even up to today, if you would go to Barcelona, you're going to notice a lot of architecture that is coming from a Muslim tradition. Um, so, bearing that in mind, we should also know that in Europe, the majority of all the countries are almost 100% Roman Catholic. And the Pope, to secure the expression of Catholic Europe, is able to invest quite a lot of funds. So a simple conclusion is that in Spain we are going to have the Roman Catholic Church as an institution um, focusing on making the majority of the people to follow the proper, proper tradition uh, in the region. And to secure this, to make sure that it will work, we are going to have the church summoning an additional institution which is called as the Holy Inquisition. And Holy Inquisition is a, is a creation that uh, is not very ethical, not very moral, and rather what these people are supposed to achieve is to find a kind of prosecution that could be easily explained to let's say to an average person and once we are going to have the trial starting then usually it is ending up on a burning pile um, if you have ever heard stories about wizards witches heretics and any kind of demons then a very very great number of such stories are precisely coming from the time of the Holy Inquisition and the lands of Spain and neighboring ones. So once this is happening the Jews unfortunately um, they are ending up the categorization if you may use such a word um, they are ending the categorization next to the wizards and witches and they face a simple choice which is either they will leave or they will convert or a burning pile is waiting. So once we know that they must leave, there is no other option, then it's not yet the time of Christopher Columbus with um, building huge ships that would be able to sail across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, this is the time that these people still must remain on the land and because of that mainly they are moving east. They are moving, um, we would say, more towards the central block of the countries in Europe. 
Um, central bloc, I mean France, I mean Belgium, I mean Italy, um, Germany, all of these. And if it comes to their stay out there, then for nearly 150 years, um, once they needed to skip Spain in around 14 century, um, they are going to have a stable situation. Of course, they would face some kind of, of, of problems uh, on average that, uh, that we cannot really mm, omit in some way. Um, so as, as they are having this stable time, then something fatal um, is happening that is changing that state. Mm, what do I mean? We are speaking about the plague and the Jews unfortunately are accused of being the ones to spread the disease. Mm, the people at that time with no access to, spe let's say, to specific and specialistic knowledge related to biology and, and I don't know, viruses like we have today, they say, um, then at that time they could not really judge, they could not give a scientific proof what was really um, the factor making the disease to, to spread so quickly. Today, with the smart people and microscopes and laboratories and all of this, um, let's say, these kind of facilities, we know that the plague was spread mainly by the rats, precisely little insects that are um, living in the fur of the rats. And except from that also, the birds could be the ones to transfer that disease. Um, with this kind of speed, the Jews were defenseless and helpless. Um, they were always accused to spread the disease, which of course they were having no responsibility for. And wherever they would not go, then let's imagine that there are such guys with coronavirus today and they are coming to your land willing to settle. It seems like quite a harsh decision to make. and. Unfortunately, once they face this kind of mistrust, then settling is almost impossible and finding a new location to settle is a necessity. And then we are going to have the Jews making their way towards east again. Um, they're going to move to find new lands, new places that where they will be having no, no prejudice. Um, the people would have no prejudice against them and this is happening so the Jews they are slowly moving east and Poland is the next one Poland, Hungary uh, and then let's say the more eastern bloc um, of the European countries they are the next one in the line we are of course going to focus on Poland and this is precisely the third pillar um, of what I wanted to present Mm, the third pillar will explain the three main factors why it was quite convenient for the Jewish population to settle. The three reasons are purely related to um, different surfaces of our lives. It's the economical surface, the religious one and the social one. So, starting with the religious part. Once the Jews, they are coming to Poland, then in that very moment, it is around the second part of the uh, 16th century, then you're going to have Reformation in Europe blooming at that time. And in fact, speaking honestly, it was quite well deserved. And uh, a very slight, uh, slight moment to stray from the story, uh, let's say, the strafe, but not very far away. The Roman Catholic Church in the old days um, would regulate a lot of things in our lives. The people were very, the people that were very religious, they would actually follow the tradition very strongly. The thing is that also over time, as the Roman Catholic tradition was a dominant one in Europe, then it became rotten. Rotten in this sense, in this human sense that if, for instance, you would have a very, very bad day and there would be terrible grey weather and the business of yours, of any kind, even if you are a farmer, then let's say that you're facing some kind of a tragedy, some kind of a very bad information. And then, as 
let's say that in the old days in Poland, the people, the, especially the landowners, would not, let's say, refrain from drinking from time to time, then let's say that we are also quite hangover in that day. Let's call it as the Grey Monday. Hmm. So, in that time, once you're going to your land, then a few peasants, let's say, did not realize that the Grey Monday is so terrible to you, they came in, let's say, started an argument with you, and this argument ended up with you decapitating them. So, obviously, not a very thoughtful decision. Um, you are having, let's say, two, three days to recover, and then you're thinking that absolutely it was, of course, a mistake. But what has been done is done. And right now the problem is existing and we need to fix it. So what do we do? We go to the priest. We go to the church, of course. And then we need the priest to admit that in the eyes of God, what we did is forgiven. And, of course, the average people, everyone, should not fear the bad landlord and his cool has just made a mistake, right? And this is precisely what the church started to allow to be happening. Um, I'm, of course, I'm coming as, the, as this broken sinner that is absolutely full of remorse. And I'm coming to the priest and I'm saying that I've brought this symbolical, this is of course a mug with hot tea, so this symbolical sack of gold with me and I've presented as a remorse of mine that I'm every day waking up and having it on my shoulder. Then the priest, he would take the sack of gold, he would say that indeed the remorse seems great. They would carry that to the back office, probably put it as I did, and then, of course, at the back office, he would take a snack or a bite, a sandwich, maybe light a candle, and then he would come back saying that after a long negotiations with Peter from the gate up there, the Peter himself, Mr. Peter, agreed so to not to throw the key with the name of the sinner away. So that eventually, one the once the final hour comes, the gate of heaven shall open. Of course, there could be similar kind of um, rhetorics, bullshit, depending on which expression do you prefer, um, happening, but altogether it was leading to the moment that the people would look, would seek for a more moral protection in this darkest hour. Um, and of course, the most fierce believers are not the millionaires, but rather the people that have little. And this is precisely, let's say, the, the, the neglection that the church has allowed. Um, what's happening is that uh, once all of this takes place in Europe, then the Jews, they migrate to Poland and then they come to the new lands. They say that they are following a different tradition, that they have a synagogue that uh, is being visited on, by them on Saturday, not Sunday. And then once someone is hearing that, then in fact, as this is precisely the time that being a Roman Catholic is slightly out of fashion, if I may say. Um, then everything fits. The Jews are facing religious tolerance. Nobody is minding a, um, a, a variety. And this is making the first factor to cement their stay. The second part is related, as I've mentioned, to the economy strictly. And if you're looking at the Polish lands, if it comes to the social structure, then the social structure is based on three, sorry, on, on three uh, main things, main groups. The clerics, which then later on we have, of course, the military, and the military, I mean the army and the king, the government. Then we are having uh, the knights as well. Then we have the landowners, which that sometimes is mixed up with being a knight, for instance. But then 
except from that you're also having the peasants, the people providing the labor, and this is in fact it. I can put the fifth finger here, but I should rather put a half of it, because there were some specialists in the Polish lands, but it's not a great number, absolutely not a great number. So this is a very important factor because the Jews they come and as we know from the previous part they are specialists mainly because of the fact that they did not have the land they needed to develop a different very important certain um, set of skills and once they are coming then it turns out that not only they are becoming worth a very big value to the king to the king in the sense that directly they would pay the tax so it is an additional pillar, an additional part to the king's budget. But I'm speaking especially about the fact that the Jews, they are on a social ground proving to actually play a very important function and to enrich the whole society in general. So this is the second factor that's very important that's, that's making the Jews to settle. And then the third part is related to the fact that the plague in the Western Europe has absolutely ruined the reputation of the Jews, which the plague, as we know, was nothing that the Jews would have anything to do with. It's just, I'd say, no evidence that are causing the situation. But as much as, as uh, the situation is, is happening, then the Jews, they eventually they move, but once they move, then a good thing is that Poland is not facing anything like the plague, at least not in the strength that the Western Europe is facing. And once the Jews they arrive, then weather conditions in Poland, I'm precisely speaking about a very strict winter, is making the main factors spreading the disease, which are the birds and the rats, so to be very strongly slowed down. In Poland, in general, once you're looking at any kind of historical documents, then they are proving that the plague did not touch these lands that much. So the Jews, they come, and then the prejudice that the people would have against them is not there, and this is precisely what's allowing them to safely start a new chapter. So, summing up everything, three factors, the religious, the economical, and the social one, they are allowing them to settle and eventually, as it was already mentioned in the previous parts, we are having the Jews reaching the number of three and a half million in Poland at the break of the Second World War. And as much as this part, this uh, period uh, of explanation, this historical period uh, that I've just explained, is finishing up the second part of the introduction, then I would like to announce that in the third part we shall speak about the Nazi ideology, how it was created, what are the little psychological actions that Mr. Adolf Hitler did undertake to convince the society to his thoughts. And then we are also going to take a look at how did the events of the Second World War develop so to eventually lead the Nazi to arrange the death camps and to speed up the process of the extermination of the Jews in Europe. I hope that you have learned something in this meeting and if you did then I would like to invite you to the third part of course, the continuation. I would like to thank you for today and wish you the very best for the rest of the day.